intently hear uh, Professor Bhagri. Uh, also, I would like to request that uh, please drop in your uh, questions related to the lecture in the chat box, which will be taken up by me or uh, Bhagri Sar post the lecture. Sir, I welcome you. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks to Vivek and all the others who have organized this talk. And it's my pleasure to be here and share a few thoughts with you. Um, and uh, I'm told that I'll speak for only about 45 minutes or so. So it will be brief and it will be merely introductory. So uh, many of you who have been doing popular culture studies would probably find what I say uh, to be a fairly, uh, let's say, what should we say, fairly introductory in nature. But anyway, that is probably the mandate of this particular talk. So we'll share a few thoughts on what popular culture studies uh, consists of, why we should do popular culture studies, what should be the methods when we do popular culture studies, etc., etc. Now, uh, as one must uh, understand Bye. that... Uh, okay, sorry. I, mean, the, I, I thought there was some someone wanted to ask something. But anyway, but that's all right. So um, what one must understand is that uh, the introduction to popular culture studies within uh, official curricula in, in universities is of a relatively recent origin uh, because uh, we would have thought that universities primarily deal with high culture and popular culture would have come in only, uh, I mean, uh, not not that recently anymore, but kind of uh, recently. So we have to understand that dynamics too. And we must understand that uh, popular culture exists as a domain only insofar as it is distinguishable from some other forms of culture, which are thought of as high, probably not necessarily unpopular, but high, maybe. So it is already a differential term. This is something that we must understand, because the moment we say popular culture and we try to define what the corpus of popular culture is, we understand that we are using a differential term. Because certain texts or certain forms are considered popular only insofar as they're distinguishable from what are considered to be therefore uh, not, not popular in that sense of the term, but probably uh, of, a, of a different denomination. Let's call it high culture. So this differentiality is something that we uh, also must bear in mind. Uh, what I also want to point out, and before I really start uh, unpacking these two terms, popular and culture, and therefore go on to talk about what popular culture studies should entail, one must try to understand why did popular culture studies uh, suddenly enter the curriculum? That is also something that we have to understand because there is a whole uh, sociological subtext to it, and which is not unimportant because uh, that would also inform many of our uh, methodologies uh, to be adopted while doing popular culture studies studies. So uh, there are at least a couple of points to be noted here. First of all, one must understand that maybe the way humanities itself in universities uh, was a fairly rarefied discipline, uh, maybe even a century or so back, definitely till the turn of the 19th century, so that uh, only a certain, only members of a certain crust of society would uh, go to universities and would be academics, so to say. And humanities, therefore, humanities professionals, both in terms of the teachers and students, the ones who would do research in the humanities, would all belong probably to a certain stratum of society with a certain cultural baggage, a certain cultural capital already associated with them. And evidently, therefore, their curricula would comprise the kind of cultural background that they would have come from. But from the end of the 19th century itself, and more so over the last century, we have had a certain democratization of education. We must understand that all of us sitting here, I'm absolutely certain, uh, all of you and I, and myself included, all of us probably belong to uh, such a stratum of society, which would not maybe three generations back necessarily have been university goers, necessarily have been students and researchers of humanities in the university. So a certain democratization of the educational process, wherein certain strata of society who were earlier not really included within the university curricular process, when they started entering the university in huge numbers, following a certain democratization of the university process, and different countries will have their own uh, histories of democratization of university spaces. So altogether, new 
strata of society would have entered the university spaces, would have become practitioners of the humanities, of literature and culture studies, and they would not necessarily have had that kind of a cultural capital or would not have come from that crust of society which only dabbled in what we call high culture. So when we entered the universities, we obviously brought with us our cultures, the cultures that we have grown up with, the cultural forms that we normally dabble in. And that would have led also to a certain democratization of the curricular structure. So obviously, if the demographics of the uh, humanities departments would have changed, evidently, the, the corpus of what humanities involves, the corpus of what literary and cultural studies involves, would have also stood changed. And that may be one of the explanations as to how popular culture studies has become so much part of a curriculum that would have otherwise earlier not even touched popular culture with a barge pole uh, and would have uh, only dabbled in what would be high culture, what would be canonical literature. So that is one explanation. The second explanation is, of course, a certain ubiquity of technology, which again, from the end of the 19th century itself, and this would be crucial a little further down my lecture too, so from the end of the 19th century, we must understand that over a very few decades, and of course that would have got further uh, solidified as 20th century moved on, within a very few decades, a whole gamut of technological devices were invented. So let's say print was invented sometime in the 15th century, and that would have been the dominant mode of literary circulation for almost five centuries or so. But suddenly it was the end of the 19th century, over a few decades, the camera, the phonograph, the soon radio, television, cinema, everything gets invented over a few decades. And the sudden influx of new modes of cultural dispensation, and which will lead to a whole a domain of mass culture, a whole, let's say, a, a super fruit, a super abundance of popular cultural forms, that is also probably a second factor, a factor that could not be ignored anymore. So no more could literary, uh, literary studies uh, necessarily engage only with print. I mean, print, which was an incidental medium, which was invented a few centuries back and is already almost on its way out, but which enjoyed a certain kind of monopoly over literary production and therefore what would have got read, what would have got discussed, that suddenly stood displaced because so many different technological means of doing culture emerged and over a very short period of time and became so ubiquitous that it wasn't possible anymore to probably ignore it, to probably ignore cultural forms that got articulated to these media. So this is also a second point. So all this I stated in a very prefatory way because uh, this does not, does not necessarily comprise the crux of what I'm going to talk about, but this kind of a prefatory point is worth noting. That is why popular culture at all? Why has popular culture at all emerged within curricular spaces where they were not touched upon, where they were not discussed earlier? So I have at least these two preliminary explanations to offer. A certain democratization of the demographics of the university and a certain ubiquity of technological means of, uh, of doing culture and which could not be ignored anymore. But that being said, the fact of the matter remains that popular culture is pretty much part of our curricular universe now. And in universities, we regularly do popular culture studies. So without going into that historical background as to why popular culture suddenly got introduced, which I've already dealt with very briefly, without going into any further detail about that, we can straight away move into these two words, popular and culture themselves, because that would be a good entry point to understand what popular culture therefore comprises and what popular culture studies therefore should be all about. Now, uh, to understand the word popular and the word culture, maybe I'll talk about the word culture first and talk about the word popular later. If we take up these two words separately, because that could be a very important entry point, uh, a good mode of entering into this discourse by trying to unpack the words, the two words that comprise this amalgam, popular culture. So, so let us do that. And to do that a very uh, easy way out for us, because someone else has already done it for us, uh, would be, and this is something that all of you are familiar with, I may use the chat box to write the names of a few articles, a few references uh, that uh, 
Otherwise, I'm sure you're familiar with. I'm sure you would have heard of Raymond Williams's keywords, right? I'm, I'm sure, but I'm just uh, as I'm talking, I'm uh, typing in the uh, in the chat box, uh, and I'm not a very good, uh, unfortunately, I mean, not a not an excellent uh, typist. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, I mean, I'll, I'll I'll try. But you must have all heard of Raymond Williams's keywords, right? So Raymond Williams, who is often thought of to be one of the founding figures of this whole discipline of culture studies, he has this book called Keywords, and which is in a way a, a lexicological study. So he takes up key words right words that are very important in doing culture studies and he analyzes those words following their history following their etymology following their lexicographical history as to how the word was first used in which century it came to have which meaning then how the meaning changed and then what meaning came up so what i meant to suggest was that uh, to be able to understand popular culture to be able to understand the phrase popular culture maybe it would be a very good exercise to try to understand the words culture and popular separately to begin with and to do that an easy way for us would be to enter raymond williams's keywords and evidently in his keywords that's a book that's the name of book uh, in his keywords he has entries on several keywords out of which evidently culture is also there and popular is also there and uh, i will not have the time considering that we have just about 45 minutes i will not have the time to take you through the whole uh, whole entry but that would have been very good because you would have got all the details as to in 1500 and such and such this person used the word culture in this sense and then the meaning changed because in 1600 and such and such this meaning emerged and that meaning it would be a, it would have been a fantastic exercise if i could have actually taken you through the entry uh, during my lecture as one would have done in a classroom where one has much more time to do it but uh, I will not be able to do it, so I would just urge you to look up. And these are things that will be very easily available online. So you can look up Raymond Williams. Raymond Williams' entry on culture in keywords. Raymond Williams' entry on popular in keywords. But let me come back to what I would therefore just summarily discuss. Now, as Raymond Williams goes on to show, and this is something that we would know etymologically, as you must understand, the word culture is connected to cultivation. And this is something that we all know. And even in Indic languages, and I'm talking only about North Indian languages because I would not be that familiar with the other uh, Indian language families, the Dravidian, the Austroasiatic, the Tibeto-Burman, etc. So talking about the uh, the Indo-European Indic languages, even in our uh, North Ind in the Indic languages, as you know, the word for culture is something like Krishti. You you are familiar with the word Krishti, I'm sure. Uh, I'll just uh, type it not with any diacritics, but just like that krishti krishti is a word that we use for culture and as you understand it's connected to the word krishi so culture means cultivation culture is connected i mean root etymologically culture is connected to the idea of cultivation is the same word actually raymond williams further goes on to show that in fact the same root word from which cultivation and culture comes is also the word from which colony and colonization comes and that is very important because the whole idea of a people settling down somewhere trying to make that place better almost from a civilizing mission as it were these things so you must understand what is cultivation cultivation doesn't mean to make things organically grow if you let the grass grow if you let the trees just organically grow all over the place you're not cultivating Cultivation means when you artificially till the land, sow the seeds, make a particular desired crop grow at the cost of other plants, which would have grown naturally, which may be weeds, you have to weed them off, or which you have to deforest so that you can bring out a field for cultivation. So cultivation entails a doing away with what is natural. And needless to say, nature and culture have therefore always been antonymous words. So nature, culture, the nature, culture dichotomy, the nature, culture binary. So culture by definition, by, it, by the original sense of the word and also the way in which the word's meaning develops over centuries, culture by definition means something that is not organic, something that is not natural, but something that is 
cultivated. And the moment we talk about cultivation, the sense of, and especially since etymologically it is also connected to colonization, the sense of a civilizing mission, a reformatory mission. So culture is a deployable tool through which a people who may have had organic uh, expressions, but those organic expressions are not good enough. Just like the organically let to grow field is not good enough. And you must cultivate that field. Similarly, the moment we talk about the word culture, the sense that emerges is that you deliberately artificially intervene in an otherwise natural field with the objective of making it better. So culture is always connected, as Raymond Williams will point out, with this civilizing mission, as it were. With this, with this whole mission of making things better. And needless to say, another word for culture, even in our Indic languages, is Sanskriti. And the word Sanskriti, as you understand, just like I said, the Krishti is derived from Krishi, which is cultivation. Sanskriti is derived from Sanskar. Sanskar means reform. Sanskar means repair. So to do sanskar of something uh, is building ko sanskar karna hai. Matab, there are so many samajik sanskars. You understand sans the word sanskar as indeed the word sanskrit also. Sanskrit, the language sanskrit also means the repaired language, the reformed language. So even the other cognate word for culture that we have in our languages, the Indic languages, is sanskriti, which literally means reformed, which literally means something that is a product of reformation, a product of repairing. So at bottom, the sense of culture is that of, on the one hand, cultivating, and on the other hand, cultivating with the purpose of making better, cultivating with the purpose of repairing, cultivating with the purpose of reforming. And this is something that we must always keep in mind. Now, does it mean, and of course, Raymond Williams goes on to show so many illustrations from the whole history of the usage of the word as to how the meaning of the word would have kept on changing. Does it mean that there is no scope for an organic culture? Must culture therefore always be deployable only? Must culture always only be a tool in the hands of the powers that are? So from whatever we have said so far, it, it seems that culture is a tool in the hands of the dominant powers, in the hands of the normative order of the day, to reform other people, to civilize other people, to make the other people cultured, so to say. But is there no scope for some kind of a resistive culture, some kind of a culture that would emerge, again, with a counter deployability, perhaps, but nevertheless, with the objective of not necessarily being deployed by the normative order of the day, but probably to resist the normative order of the day. And herein, Raymond Williams takes us to Arnold or through Arnold to a whole possibility of how culture would often emerge also as an antidote in the usage of the word culture. So on the one hand, there is civilization and Raymond Williams goes on to show that we were so far talking about culture being a means of civilizing, culture being a means of the civilization, civilizing mission. But on the other hand, as Raymond Williams also goes on to show, by the mid-late 19th century, culture also comes to acquire a possibly resistive sense. That is, the normative order of the day is anarchic. The normative order of the day and civilization, therefore, has led us, has pushed us to over-industrialization, to a kind of dehumanization. And culture, almost a people's culture can be developed as a potential antidote to it. So a second sense of the culture, the first was something that is deployed by the normative order, imposed upon the masses to civilize them. The other was somehow a resistive culture that comes from below with the objective of almost dismantling or at least somehow uh, trying to trying to uh, trying to cope with the official culture. So that sense is also there. Raymond Williams also goes on to show that how uh, towards the end of the 19th century, and I have to soon move on because I'm, I'm keeping a watch on the watch also, move on to the other keyword popular. But Raymond Williams also goes on to show that by the end of the 19th century, because of this possibility of 
culture being on the outside of the normative order of the day, the second possibility, the second meaning of the term culture, there also emerges by the end of the 19th century a certain pejorative sense with the word culture. Because, and this also has to do with the aesthete movement by the end of the 19th century, where almost, and Raymond Williams will go on to show how words like culture vulture, or words like even, let's say, parodying culture by using words like culture, you know? So, uh, I mean, almost one suggesting that these are useful people. These are good people who work for the order of the day, who work for the system. And those are those good for nothing cultured people who do culture and all that. So culture also acquires a certain sense of being indolent, being lazy, being dilettante, being useless, so to say. So that negative sense also comes in. Raymond Williams closes his whole idea of his entry on culture with a suggestion, therefore, that there is this duality in the word culture. On the one hand, there can indeed be a sense where culture becomes a tool in the hands of the normative order of the day to be deployed unto the masses, unto people, to civilize them. And on the other hand, Culture could also have the sense of almost being an antidote in the Arnoldian sense, culture and anarchy, almost an antidote to what the normative order has done to us. And both these senses seems to uh, seem to continue uh, simultaneously, leading to therefore this uh, this almost fraught terrain. So culture is almost a terrain uh, which almost becomes like a battleground in a way. So let us let us keep the sense of culture reserved here for the time being and similarly move on to popular. Now, Raymond Williams, of course, has his keyword entry on the word popular, but there are some other uh, interesting readings also, keyword type readings. Uh, this also you must look up. I'm just uh, typing another uh, another very uh, important uh, 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 important article. You must you must uh, look it up uh, because that would give you some more reading. Someone called Murag Shiak. She wrote an article which has been variously published as the popular or changing definitions, uh, changing uh, sorry, changing definitions of the. Just pardon my typos. Okay, changing definitions of the word popular. So uh, that is that is also another uh, another title with which this particular article by Morak Shiak is often found. So you can just Google out Morak Shiak. So she also does a similar kind of a keyword uh, study of the word popular to again find pretty much like Raymond Williams does in his keywords how the term popular has also changed its meaning. So earlier we suggested that the word culture has changed its meanings over time. Similarly, we can see the word popular has also changed its meaning over time. And both Raymond Williams's keyword entry on popular and also Murag Shiak's very influential study of changing definitions of the word popular, they are both uh, studies into how the word popular originally emerged. So popular, of course, literally means of the people, okay? Because populi, populi, population, popular, people, people, right? So of the people. But initially, as both Raymond Williams and Murag Shiak point out, the word popular had a more legal political sense, which is popular government, popular law, especially in the 16th century when monarchies were being dismantled and democratic governments were being set in their place in Europe, all over Europe. That was when the word popular first started uh, getting used. And in a very political, very governmental, very legal sense, popular government means a government of the people. Popular law means a law that no more follows from a sovereign, the monarch, but rather law that has also been evolved and devised by the people, so on and so forth. But they go on to show, and again to cut a long story short, that soon the word popular starts acquiring other meanings, because the original meaning, and the original meaning was, of course, only in a legal governmental domain, but soon they start to uh, acquire other meanings. And one of those meanings becomes that of pejoration. And a pejorative sense gets associated with the word popular very early on. And that is also because of the connection with the word populist because it was suggested on two counts. First, it was presumed that whatever is popular, so initially, the point that I'm trying to make is that initially the word popular had a positive sense. That is, uh, to, 
to welcome governments that have been set up by the people of the people to welcome legal systems that have been set up by the people against more oppressive more despotic regimes that earlier ruled over europe but from this fairly positive sense of the word popular soon the fact that popular meant of the people and therefore of the common people this also started acquiring a negative sense a sense of pejoration and on two counts as i said first on counts of it being therefore base it being common it therefore being of low taste etc and the other on grounds of it potentially also being populist which means something that is oriented towards curing favors which is oriented towards pleasing people and which is therefore not genuine which is therefore not honest but populist so because of the close connection with the word populist it acquires a negative meaning soon I could have gone on with the whole history, but obviously I do not have time. I am uh, keeping a close watch on uh, time as it's passing by. Uh, but both of them, in these two separate essays, they go on to suggest how the sense of the term popular keeps changing. So at times it acquires this very negative sense. At times, however, it gets associated with the autochthonous voice of the people, and therefore something that is good, something that is to be welcomed, something that is really uh, something that has within it a potential that is liberatory in nature. So almost like a yo-yo, as it were, almost like a swinging pendulum. The sense of the word popular would uh, would almost swing from being fairly positive to fairly negative, and it goes on like this. but and uh, raymond williams ends his entry with a very interesting observation as to how a uh, popular gains a certain acceptance only by the mid 20th century and however it is accompanied with the emergence of another word pop and the moment there is this diminution of popular into pop there is also an allied charge of trivialization so another sense kind of gets like we say a pop science pop quiz so again popular has another sense gets added to it because of a certain diminution and a certain trivialization by the middle of the 20th century by the diminution of the word popular into pop and which is that probably what goes on in the name of popular is not really not really all that respectable it's something that is trivial something that is inconsequential etc etc but whatever the crux of both these entries the crux of uh, both these articles is however pretty similar to what we were talking about in the case of culture so once again it seems that the term popular also has two senses two clear senses emerge from it one is when popular also becomes a means of deployment like we were talking about popular government popular law where and also populism is a part of it because maybe the policies of the government could be oriented not to as doing de- doing real good to the people but to only curry favor by being populist etc etc so there is a deployable aspect to it so the normative order of the day can deploy the popular to do something to do certain things unto the masses and on the other hand comes the other sense that the popular could also be the authentic autochthonous organic voice of the masses themselves the masses themselves speaking out for themselves with an outpouring of their own cultural forms so once again we are back to the same struggle the same duality that we saw when we were dealing with the word culture so it could be both on the one hand popular and culture both popular and culture can be either tools which the normative order of the day deploy to ideologize the masses to govern the masses to civilize the masses or conversely both popular and culture could be forms that the masses themselves produce resistively organically to almost battle it out with the normative order of the day and therefore popular and culture both become battle grounds in a way both become terrains that are fraught with these contradictions so 
two senses have emerged. If we now put popular and culture together, if we now come up with the phrase popular culture, since both the words popular and culture have this dual sense about them, the moment we put the two words together into a phrase popular culture, we also have the same duality. So popular culture in itself as a domain is a contested domain. Because, and there are two interpretations. So what do we think of popular culture? What does popular culture do? So one school of thought, one mode of understanding would be that popular culture is not really people's culture. Popular culture is manufactured by the powers that are, by the ones who are in power, by the ones who hold the normative positions. And popular culture becomes a tool for ideologization, for indoctrination. And the powers that are, they kind of impose these popular cultural forms onto the people to be able to indoctrinate them, to be able to civilize them, to be able to mold them in certain ways. And on the other hand is the other view that no, 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 popular culture is the organic output the organic overflow, the autochthonous overflow of the people themselves. And therefore, it can be often resisted. It can actually reply back to the normative order. It can resist the normative order. So these two senses emerge very strongly. And needless to say, it is these two senses that the uh, almost, let's say, the, the who's who of when we try to study mass culture, when we try to study popular culture, and we go through certain readings, these are the two positions that we uh, always take up. To share some more readings with you, and again, uh, things that you would be absolutely familiar with, I'm sure. So for instance, uh, Adorno and Horkheimer's uh, uh, The Culture Industry, uh, you are, I'm sure, absolutely familiar with it. Uh, or for that matter, so I'm still writing it nevertheless. So I don't know Horkheimer's uh, major article, which you're all familiar with from their dialectic of enlightenment, the culture industry, enlightenment is mass deception, and which is uh, also followed uh, with, with what they thought of as a rejoinder. So they have another article written, uh, written a few decades, three decades or so later, which is called culture industry reconsidered. So it is by Adorno uh, alone. So uh, you are familiar with Adorno and Horkheimer and their position. So their position is of the first sort. That is, what is popular culture? What is mass culture? Because they make a distinction between mass culture and popular culture, but distinction that I may not be necessarily able to go into today. But as you all know, according to Adorno and Horkheimer, it's simple. These mass cultural forms, these cultural industrial forms, this cinema, television, and now more and more internet, uh, radio, all these technological means of peddling mass culture, of peddling popular culture, these are not really people's culture. The ordinary people, they don't produce these cultural texts. The ordinary people don't produce films. They don't produce radio shows. They are made to consume these. And these are Packaged. So all mass cultural products are packaged products. The ones who hold the strings to power, the one who rule over the current normative order of the day, they manufacture these popular cultural packages and impose it on the masses. And the masses have to just dumbly uh, consume whatever is dished out to them. And they get indoctrinated in the process. And therefore, popular culture, mass culture particularly, technologized mass culture particularly, particularly, plays an ideological role to indoctrinate the masses and make them complicit, consenting cogs in the whole machine of normativity. Now, this is one position, the position that we've already talked about. On the other hand, again, you're familiar with, uh, and uh, this is this is again very important, Walter Benjamin's, Walter Benjamin's very major essay, and which quite espouses the other alternative. So we have already talked about these uh, two uh, alternatives. So Benjamin's essay, as you would all know, the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction, that practically talks about the other alternative because Benjamin's suggestion is that no, on the contrary, earlier art had a cultic value. 
So what I was also talking about a little while back. So only certain people, only certain strata of society, art would sit on the top of an ivory tower, accessible by only those who have a certain cultural capital. And art was to be treated with reverence, with veneration. But now, because of this technological takeover, art has been pulled down. In the age of technological reproduction, art has been pulled down from those cultic ivory towers and it has got democratized. Mass culture is a democratization of culture. Popular culture is people's culture. Far from it being only an ideological means through which the powers that are try to govern us and try to control us and try to civilize us. On the contrary, technologized mass culture is a democratizing process. It has pulled down art from those ivory tower loci and made it people's culture, people's voices. So popular culture is actually something that is resistive, something that is democratizing, something that is liberatory. And of course, uh, this continues, this, this whole debate, this duality pretty much continues. And we have some extreme pessimists on the one hand. So people like Baudria, I wouldn't uh, waste time by writing down, but you're familiar with Baudria, uh, Jean Baudria and his... Uh, his theorization of simulations. So he would be of the extreme pessimist sort. That is, what has mass culture done? It has completely robbed us of reality. These popular cultural forms, so they have made us inhabit this bubble, this hyper-real illusory bubble. And we have lost all touch with reality. And we've got ideologized with whatever now we are fed with. And we've started believing in these fake newses and false uh, realities. You get the idea, okay? The mediatized universe has completely surrounded us and there is no connection to reality left. And on the other hand, there'll be hyper-optimists, like someone like Marshall McLuhan, for that matter, who in his understanding media, very major book, which you all should take up, he goes on to suggest that, no, these electronic media, they're actually means of what we were talking about uh, uh, earlier, means of connecting, means of building up new networks, means of in fact resisting the normative order of the day, means of resisting the implosion that we face in the hands of the normative order of the day. So the, these two positions, I was talking about this duality, this duplicity. So on the one hand, some people would be really, would almost diss popular culture by saying that no, no, what is popular culture? Popular culture is the storehouse of all problematic values. Popular culture is the most sexist, most racist. And popular culture is the domain of all kinds of bad taste. And they're actually means of ideologization because the powers that are, they manufacture these texts and dish it out to us poor, hapless masses who cannot but consume them. And as we consume them, we get ideologized and we can do nothing about it. And on the other hand will be that optimistic poll who would say that no, but popular culture is democratizing. Popular culture is the voice of the masses. Popular culture is actually resistive. Popular culture is through which people speak out. And this dichotomy and this two positions, these two positions would continue uh, amongst all theoreticians. And some would probably equivocate just to uh, name another article. Uh, again, you must be familiar with Frederick Jameson's uh, famous article, uh, Reification and Utopia in Mass Culture. This is something that is worth reading. So Frederick Jameson, whom you're otherwise familiar with, so he kind of equivocates. He says, no, 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 it's a bit of reification, a bit of utopia. So popular culture does both. On the one hand, it reifies, but on the other hand, it also allows us to have visions of alternative worlds, visions of utopia. So it's still an equivocation. It's still an equivocation between these two positions. But a very fruitful intervention comes from Stuart Hall. And Stuart Hall is again someone that I'm sure you're familiar with and who has been instrumental in the whole Birmingham school and a, uh, and a most deserving successor to uh, Raymond Williams and who therefore almost becomes as much of a father figure, so to say, uh, in the whole culture studies and uh, popular culture studies business. He has a fantastic article. And again, I'm just uh, writing down the title of the article and you must Google it out. Again, it will be very easily available. It's a very common article. He talks about... Deconstructing the Popular, Notes on Deconstructing the Popular. That's the name of this very, very major article by Stuart Hall. Now, Stuart Hall goes on to give us two very important points. 
months. And uh, as I see time is running out, uh, I will, I, I'll, of course, I'm sure there'll be a spillover. I'll spend a little more than 45 minutes, I'm certain. But nevertheless, with uh, after having talked about Stuart Hall, I'll just wrap things to a close since time is running out. So Stuart Hall in this particular article says a couple of very important things. The first thing that he says is precisely what we have been saying so far, that there have been dominantly two positions vis-a-vis -vis popular culture. What are the two positions? One position is that popular culture is but an ideological tool through which the dominant forces try to govern us, try to civilize us. That is one position. The other position is just the reverse position that no, no, popular culture is people's own culture through which the people, they organically speak of themselves and they resist normativity. Stuart Hall says that both these positions, the two positions that we saw through Raymond Williams, through Morak Shiak, through Adonan and Horkheimer and Benjamin, through uh, McLuhan and, um, and Bodria, through Frederick Jameson, these two positions, Stuart Hall says, are untenable. We cannot give in to this binary. It is not that it is either this or that. Or it is not even as Jameson would do. It is not even that we can balance and say, okay, thora sa ye, thora sa wo. A bit ideologizing, a bit resistive. It is a bit reification, a bit utopia. Stuart Hall says that this binary itself is useless. It's specious. On the contrary, and he says we have to come up with a third definition of popular culture, a third notion, a third mode of understanding popular culture, and which he explains to the idea of being pro-people. Now, this is extremely important, as he goes on to suggest that popular culture should forever be, neither should it be simply a means through which the dominant powers try to indoctrinate us, nor should it be the simple idea of an organic, uh, organic response on the part of the masses, an authentic response of the people. Both of these are very simplistic definitions. Rather, and something that I hinted on earlier too, rather popular culture has to be seen as this continuous terrain of struggle, this continuous terrain of, uh, of a battle going on. And what is the battle? The battle is, so what is the, what is the mandate of being popular? The mandate is of being with the people. And that is very important. So doing popular culture studies, as Stuart Hall says, and I'm summarizing to the extreme, but you must read up this very important article. But there is no rationale of doing popular culture unless and until you are forever ready to critique the, the modes of culture themselves to forever be pro-people. And Stuart Hall goes on to say that the terrains change. So what may be resistive today, for instance, to give a stray example, so for instance, a particular group, that particular group currently is dispossessed. And therefore, it has its cultural forms, which are indeed, which do indeed lodge a struggle against the normative powers of the day, and it is resistive in nature. But tomorrow, if that group comes to occupy power, if that group comes in a position of power, then that group is not resistive anymore. That same group. So if your ideological leanings are so fixed that you are always with the position of this group and you very much identify with the positions of this group, but no, no more, not beyond that then you are likely not to be able to ever fulfill the mandate of doing popular culture. Because the moment, what was popular earlier, because it was resistive at that point of time, it was pro-people at that point of time, it itself becomes the official discourse, then you will not have any more the sensibility to step out of your comfort zone and start critiquing your own beliefs. But that is what Stuart Hall thinks is absolutely essential. To do popular culture studies is to be forever ready to negotiate one's own beliefs, one's own prejudices, one's own positions, so that I'm always, so popular culture is a continuous battleground. And where continuously, irrespective of who, irrespective of regimes top getting toppled, irrespective of someone else coming to power, that and only that will continue to be popular cultural, which somehow still has the possibility within it to speak for the downtrodden, for the people. But this is the first.
first point that Stuart Hall makes. The second point that Stuart Hall makes, and that is the more important point, and with which I'll close my discussion today, is that furthermore, Stuart Hall brings to the forefront the idea of enjoyment. Because so far, what we have talked about, still, so whether you're looking at it from the perspective of the dominant structures using popular culture to dominate us, or we were talking about the, the downtrodden groups using popular culture to reply back and resist, or we were talking about equivocating, or we were talking about a continuous struggle where the groups may change positions, but I, as a popular culture critic, must always have within me the, the spirit to be pro-people rather than uh, rather than anti people so all these still presume somehow a certain ideological battle the ideological battle could be fought from whichever angle but it was still an ideological battle the objective of doing popular culture studies was still ideology critique but as you must understand the fundamentals of popular culture why is popular culture popular to begin with? Why are certain texts popular? So the fundamental principle of popularity is not contingent upon its ideological function. It is contingent rather upon the fact that we like it. We enjoy it. I mean, certain texts are popular. Certain texts are lovable. Certain texts we laugh at, we enjoy. And that is what really is the crux of popular cultural texts. So if we miss out on that, if we perform only ideology critiques, and if we only presume, if we presume that doing popular culture studies is primarily to be able to analyze texts of popular culture ideologically, then we've missed out the point. Popular culture texts have to be studied qua popular. They have to be studied in terms of the dynamics of enjoyment that they build up. And this is a very important point, and I'm sure it will be brought up during the discussion. Uh, as I can see, uh, there are some questions that are being typed here. The point is that in humanities itself, in literary studies itself, and different culture studies also, in popular culture studies more specifically, we cannot restrict our studies to doing only ideology critique. That is the common sense. You take up any poem and do some gender, class, race, and let it be. That may be one function of the literary text. That ideological function may be one function of the popular cultural text. But that is not its primary function. Its primary function is to provide entertainment. Its primary function is to provide enjoyment. So till such time that we have methodologically dealt with the enjoyment principle of the texts till such time that we've been able to foreground the, the means through which a popular cultural text becomes popular to begin with, becomes entertaining to begin with. We would not have really done popular culture studies. And this is a very important point that Stuart Hall makes. And one must understand that enjoyment itself is a subversive activity. In fact, the normative order of the day would want us to be austere, would want us to be serious, would want us to be stiff upper lipped, would want us to be differential, reverential with our heads and eyes low. On the contrary, entertainment, enjoyment, that has within it that subversive power to completely blow into smithereens the normative order of the day. So enjoyment is not even escapism. Enjoyment, on the contrary, is to even further foreground the real subversive aspect that literature and culture have to offer. So let me close here. It's been uh, quite some time. I've taken 50 minutes, as I can see, which is fine, which is uh, okay. So just to kind of briefly put things in perspective, and this was a very introductory lecture, as I told you, but if you are to do popular culture studies, first of all, you have to understand why are we doing popular culture studies at all? And that is because, as I said, because a particular contextual democratization has forced university structures to introduce our culture. Because we do not come with it. We don't grow up listening to Chopin, Beethoven. We have grown up hearing Anu Malik. So obviously, I mean, we, we our inflow into the university structure, certain democratization of context and another contextual factor of this electronic technological takeover of the cultural domain. These two unavoidable contextual factors have made it imperative that popular culture becomes a part of our curricular discourse. Second, if we have to do popular culture, we have to understand the words popular and culture separately. And as we saw, both the words popular and culture and therefore the phrase popular and culture, popular culture comes with 
two automatic senses. One, that it is a means that is deployed by the power structures that are to civilize us. And the other is, it is a means that organically we, the downtrodden people, we voice ourselves, the masses voice themselves. And these two antithetical positions dominate popular culture studies, the methods of popular culture studies. Or at best you can equivocate and you can say that it does this also, that also. But third and more importantly, maybe this dichotomy of method, that is you take a text of popular culture and either see how it becomes a means of ideologization by the power structures that are, or it becomes a means of resistance by the masses. This is, this is infructuous. This is facetious. On the contrary, we have to rather talk about first how it's an ever-changing battleground. And the idea is not to get stuck with this position or that position, but rather to understand that how popular culture becomes a platform of being forever pro-people. So much so that you may have to go against your own interests if you realize that your own ideological interests are not pro-people. So forever to be critical, even of what you strongly believed in, you strongly do, uh, do have uh, an, uh, allegiances to. And second, we cannot study popular culture but by foregrounding the principles, our methodologies have to be such that we foreground the principle of enjoyment and entertainment because that is the crux of popular culture and that also becomes probably the most subversive aspect that popular culture has to offer. So thank you very much for your patience and uh, I see several questions. Uh, is the idea that I, I scroll through the questions or um, is somebody going to take over from here? What is the idea? Yes, sir. I could take it for you. Okay, Question. sure. Thank you. Yeah. First of all, so thank you so much for uh, such an informative introductory lecture on popular culture. I'm sure all of us have our uh, very own takeaways, which have, you know, uh, provocated thoughts in uh, different ways. So uh, now I would like to take um, uh, take a few questions. First question is by Sanskriti Pujari. And first of all, she's thanking you for uh, such a highly engaging and informative lecture. She's further asking, what is the future of research in the field of popular culture? Is popular culture in India more inclined to the definition of being a normative order that is imposed upon the masses? Uh, further, she's saying the meaning of her name has changed for her today, as uh, she says that it stands as a product of reformity. So that's her question, sir. Uh, yeah, so right. It seems, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I, I uh, have unmuted myself. Um, so, uh, and uh, so you, you've started also rethinking your name. That's all right. <laughs> That's all right. Sanskriti, I mean, means culture at the end of, just like culture means culture. I mean, etymologically, it may be connected to doing sanskar and therefore reforming. Oh. But that you should not uh, too seriously start uh, an identity renegotiation now. You are Sanskriti and you are fine. Your name uh, stands what it was. Uh, but anyway, uh, your question is very important. Uh, sadly, you are right because uh, maybe the thrust on a particular kind of ideology critique uh, always forces us to probably look at texts, including popular cultural texts, only from that perspective of how uh, it becomes necessarily a means of imposition by the normative order. And therefore, maybe the methodologies that we primarily internalize, the Adorno-Horkheimerian methodology, so to say, uh, primarily makes us geared towards doing popular culture studies from this perspective. That is, if I have a particular Hindi pot boiler to analyze, I'll primarily look at how it becomes a storehouse of all kinds of sexism, racism, casteism, and therefore, this becomes just a vehicle of ideologizing the masses and making them internalize all kinds of problematic beliefs. But while this is true, this is the common sense. This is the mainstay of the kind of methods that you're taught in class. Because in the classroom, these are the methods that you're taught. But then you need not succumb to these methods. What you make of popular culture studies, and of course, I'm presuming that you're a young researcher, definitely much younger than me. And therefore, the future is in your hands. I mean, ultimately, you cannot... I mean, this is like this is this is symptomatic of the same kind of ideologization that we are trying to be critical of. So it's not that kya kare, I have been taught only this and therefore I'll do only this. If the future is in your hands, so if you suck 
come to this uh, easy way out of looking at popular culture, looking at mass culture only from the normativizing, ideologizing perspective, then you would unfortunately be led to only this future. But if you yourself as a researcher try to, on the contrary, unearth the undergrowth of enjoyment, if you try to recover popular culture from this burden of ideology critique, then you as a young researcher today would lay out the terrain of popular culture, culture studies of the future. So therefore, uh, I would not be as pessimistic as you, because of course, though you 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 had you've raised a question, what is the future? But it almost sounds like a rhetorical question. Is there any future? Well, I would be fairly optimistic. I think there is a future and the future is in your hands. But to be able to have a future in popular culture studies, we have to step out, as Stuart Hall said, we have to step out of this dyadic rut of ideology, of ideology critique. Popular, I mean, one of the functions of popular culture, as indeed of all literary texts, is indeed ideological. There is no denial of that. But that is not the primary function of popular culture. So if we redeem popular culture studies from this burden of doing mere ideological critique and instead try to talk about popular culture qua popular, then I'm sure we will no more necessarily make this uh, this bleak future emerge and we'll have a robust, vibrant future of popular culture awaiting for us. And the onus is on you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I'm, uh, I'm sure Sanskriti would have got her answer. Next question, um, next question is by me. And uh, uh, it reads as, uh, sir, as you've mentioned that uh, there are two opinions about popular culture, one being indoctrinate, indoctrinating and the other being liberating and resisting. So uh, how can we understand folk culture um, a folk culture in juxtaposition with this popular culture understanding we have received today, is it a resistive force for the first opinion mentioned by you or is it aligned with the second opinion mentioned? Yes. Uh, so first of all, one must understand that it would be easy for us to say that folk is of the second sort. That is, folk is the original, authentic outpouring of the masses themselves, right? But it's not that easy because what is folk and what is not folk is itself defined because of certain power structures. So to be labeled as folk, for instance, I'll give you an example and people who are from the southern part of India would be able to immediately identify. Why is Kathakali classical and Yakshagana folk? I mean, there is no explanation. That is because canonization processes. So in short, what is folk is also not outside of the scope of canonization, outside the scope of ideological compartmentalization. So the easy temptation would be to presume that the canon is imposed from the top and the folk is the people's authentic resistant discourse. But it's not that simple because what is labeled as folk is in itself a construct of the order of the day is in itself a construct of the normative order of the day. So it is not as authentically peoples as we presume it to be. And furthermore, the folk is also recuperated within, let's say, means of co-optation. So let's say if you go to, uh, the, I'm, I being from Delhi, I'm giving the example of Delhi Hart, but you can have your own emporia where you can have little trinkets. So the folk getting uh, massified and commercialized and appropriated into an urban market or even further fusions like urban folk. I mean, the whole term urban folk. So let's say folk in itself is also a pretty tortuous domain. So therefore, what I would plead is that rather than sticking to this dichotomy, because this dichotomy itself is problematic. That is the point. That is the point that Stuart Hall was raising. And that is the point that I also ended my lecture with. So this is an easy dichotomy methodologically popular culture studies has been caught up with this dichotomy for a century. And now is the time, not now. I mean, Stuart Hall is not someone who is now. I mean, for half a century, we have had calls to the effect of us stepping out of this binary. So this easy binary, easy methodological binaries. So if I am to study a popular cultural text, either I am to study it as something of an imposition, a governmental manipulative imposition, or we must see it as an authentic outpouring of the masses themselves, resistive in itself. Both of these are essentializing. 
And both these positions are deeply problematic. Rather, we must try to understand. And therefore, what is folk today may become the dominant tomorrow. So let's say uh, a certain very folk position about what our modes of governmentality should be like. Let's say I'm, I'm giving a bad crude and out of context example, let's say the Taliban's takeover of the Afghan governmental operation. Now, one could have said that Taliban's own mode of being or its own beliefs, they were very foxy outside of the scope of modern civilized governmental apparatus. But now they are the government. So the point is that if we stick to the binary, then we'll forever miss out the real mandate of popular culture studies. The real mandate is that I may stand with the folk when the folk is downtrodden, but I will go anti that very folk when that folk has taken over power. Because my objective is neither to get stuck with this pole of the binary or that pole of the binary, but to forever keep the flame of criticality alive. And to keep that flame of criticality alive, my primary methodological tool would be that of the subversion that enjoyment itself causes. And therefore, uh, I think that uh, to, to go back to your question, that it's easy to identify folk with the second position, but it's not desirable to do so. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, the second question is by Mir Ahmed Ali. He's from uh, Medinipur, West Bengal, and he raises a query which uh, says, what is your take on Bhaktan's notion of carnivalist or carnival and the subversion of the dominant culture? If culture, as you've just mentioned, is an antidote to the normative order, then how do you look at Bhaktan's carnivalist? Do you see carnival as part of the popular culture? Yes, uh, uh, right, Meer. So I, I don't think that popular is an antidote to dominant culture. That is one position. And the position that Stuart Hall has warned us, I mean, so the two positions that emerge are that popular culture, I'm, I'm just repeating myself, but hopefully you've got it. The two positions that emerge in the usual canon of popular culture studies, in the usual canon of popular culture studies the theory is this, that either popular culture has to be seen as a deployable tool that the dominant culture uses to control the masses. Or the other position is that popular culture is the organic, authentic outpouring of the masses themselves. And and therefore, it can be an antidote to official culture. What I meant to say was both of these positions are deeply problematic. And this binary is not sustainable. And in fact, the example that you've taken up is a perfect example of that. So as Bhaktin's carnivalist goes on to show, the Bhaktin's theory of carnivalist, the carnival is not really something that actually resists. Because the carnival is more like a safety valve. So only as, as Bhakti makes it very clear, the dominant culture almost allows for these little spaces. So the carnival will not last beyond the day of the carnival. The carnival, the moment the carnival is over, the so-called subversion of the carnival is also over. So it's only within that restricted space of the carnival that you can strut around with your protrusions and orifices and you can do acts that would have otherwise been considered to be grotesque, like defecating and fornicating, etc. We, we need not go into the details of the carnival, as you all know. But what Bhakti makes very clear is that the carnival is not there to stay. Nor does the carnival in any significant way either resist or antidotize the normative order. On the contrary, the normative order strengthens itself and the normative order actually returns even more powerful, having allowed you this safety valve. Having allowed you this little, so if you were not allowed to express yourself ever, then your pent up anger may someday take the form of a full fledged revolution. The carnivalesque, the carnival becomes a classic device for containing the revolution. Because if you allow some special, today you can go and do whatever, no caste, no nothing. Right? So this carnival is never a real reversal at all. And therefore, the point that I was trying to make is best brought out by the example that you have given. So Bhaktin's idea of carnivalism exactly goes on to show how this so-called dichotomy, that there is official culture which tries to dominate, and then there is people's culture which authentically resists. This binary does not hold. And the carnival is a classic case in point where you may presume that people have done their own carnivalist things and 
and therefore we have been able to provide an antidote. We have been able to resist dominant culture, but that's not true at all. It was just but a safety valve. And therefore, my submission once again, following Stuart Hollywood, be that neither of these two positions are sustainable as methods of doing popular culture studies. On the contrary, we have to think of popular culture as a domain that is forever tortuous, that is forever dynamic, and that would forever be the battle line of being pro people. And that, and uh, along with that, of course, the enjoyment aspect. So yes, so that would be my uh, take uh, on Bakhtin's Carnivalist, and which is not an uh, antidote to the normative order, but but a uh, safety valve for the normative order to even more strongly be able to establish itself. Right. Thank you, sir. So uh, the next question is by Arijit Mukherjee. Firstly, he's thanking you for uh, the lecture. And uh, the question he's raising is, does pop culture need a critique or a critique needs pop culture for surviving intellectually and professionally? That's a very important question. And that would lead, of course, to a whole idea of academic cynicism also, which I will just take, a, take half a minute to talk about. So Popular culture needs a critique. There is no doubt about that. Lest pop culture also, uh, I mean, gets too ossified or too calcified or gets a real, because the feedback loop is very important. Popular culture always has a critique. Only we probably do not recognize it because the critique does not follow the same idiom as our own academic critique. Popular culture's critique is a rejection by the audience. If a particular text, if a particular film does not work in the box office, that is the critique that pop culture gets. And obviously the filmmakers would be aware of what formula works and what things do not work, what the audience rejects. In fact, popular culture's feedback loop is much more robust than high culture because in high culture, I mean, whether one likes it or not, if a certain thing has got canonized, is there to stay. Of course, still such time that it's dismantled. But in popular culture, there's this continuous critique and continuous feedback. And since a lot of commercial investment is often involved, evidently, if you're not able to make money and you will be you will not be able to make money if people are critical of you if people are not accepting of what you produce then you will not be able to produce that kind of a film anymore or that kind of a popular cultural text anymore so popular culture does need critique there is no doubt about that and it does get critique also continuously it gets critiqued continuously but your second part is what leads me uh, to as i said a certain uh, at least a footnote on academic cynicism you are absolutely right that maybe while popular culture not only needs critique, but gets its critique, but popular culture does not necessarily wait for our critique. So we, we few university intellectuals, we will get down and analyze, uh, let's say, whatever mukbang, that is, you know, overeating videos. And then and only then the particular popular cultural form would change or whatever. They are not waiting for our review. So we are probably often curricularly engaging in these kinds of reviews views for our own little incestuous self-contained games. And you're absolutely right. I get your uh, question completely. So we almost to survive intellectually and professionally, we must do what seems to be fashionable. We must move on with the times. We kind of, now that popular culture has entered the curriculum, so now we are talking about popular culture studies. You're absolutely right. And that kind of a sense of irony is pretty much there. And we should all, all be self, I mean, if at all, pop doing popular culture studies requires self-criticality and self-reflexivity, then let it begin here. So evidently, when we intellectuals sit in our safe space classrooms and pass judgments on this particular pot boiler or that particular Facebook post or that particular folk tale, then we are probably doing a very self-contained exercise for our own survival, for our own professional uh, brownie scoring, uh, you know, points, etc, etc. I understand. But, and this is a footnote that I have to offer, that cynicism is fine. But when cynicism goes beyond self-criticality, so if this kind of cynicism is oriented towards being self-reflexive and self-critical, and therefore we intellectuals become genuine rather than this kind of sham, I mean, making our whole exercise become just a sham towards acquiring some professional brownie points. But when cynicism sets in deep, when we become so cynical that we, and cynicism is a very important point, I'm sure that all of you are uh, aware of uh, cynicism, 
and uh, since i am into using the text box uh, i'm sure you are all aware of uh, peter sloted dykes uh, very major book uh, peter sloted dyke critique of cynical reason so this is the name of the book uh, of course jishek has also talked about it uh, talked about this book and other other things very uh, prominently so i've just written up the name of book critique of cynical peter sloted dykes uh, critique of cynical reason which is a must read for all of you so what i was suggesting was that cynicism till, till a certain extent is okay because it's required for self reflexivity but beyond that if we become so cynical that we we all together give up our task our task as intellectuals what we are supposed to do then we'd be probably led to a very very uh, very sad day because uh, we I mean, we can let, let an overarching cynicism take us over then whatever we are doing is so meaningless there's got no relevance whatsoever with what the petrol price is or what is happening uh, in terms of communal fascism all over the world i mean so what we are doing i mean this we dekho we people we have just got together and discussing some silly people and so hum kare to kare क्या बोले तो बोले क्या बट दिस सिनिसिजम इफ इट रियली सेट्स इन देन वी हु आर सपोज टू बी द वॉइस ऑफ क्रिटिकैलिटी then that and, and we become so cynical then a, a very sad day lies ahead of us so i would suggest that what you have said is absolutely true and we intellectuals should be self reflexive about it but let that criticality help us to become even more critical as intellectuals rather than become so cynical and defeatistic that we give up the cause of criticality right thank you so much sir the next question is by rajneesh kumar and he is asking long ago technical innovations brought wild change in popular culture but even our curriculum dominant print media uh, so how how we are going to change this dynamics uh, yeah no the curriculum is continuously changing and not only the curriculum the pedagogic methods also look at us I mean, we are using technology. I mean, currently, for the last one and a half years, for better or for worse, I'm not saying that this is better than classroom teaching. But I don't think print is the dominant medium anymore. You are right that maybe in your curriculum, it depends on wh which university you study in. That that also becomes very important. But I'm aware of the fact that in many universities, print probably still is the primary mode of uh, curricular practice. But it is it is changing. It is changing rapidly. And even so-called print. Texts. If you are not reading them in print anymore, they are not print anymore. So, uh, and that is that is because you must understand literature. I mean, if if we talk about literature, now you must understand that if print becomes the defining, so print is a medium, right? So, if print is what you think literature is defined by, then Kalidas is not literature, Chaucer is not literature, Homer is not literature. I can keep on naming. They are all pre-print. They they are the literary greats, but they were never published. published in print you incidentally read them in print probably because by the time you were reading print was invented but then again now you are probably not reading them in print anymore even the readings that i today uh, uh, circulated in this chat box i said that google kar lena mil jayega we are all we hardly use print anymore so the takes themselves were also even shakespeare marlow i mean in their lifetime probably printed versions br were brought out like the first folio and all that but their texts were not in print so you may be reading them in print that is another issue they are not print texts right because they were originally performative texts oral texts the examples that i before the advent of print so print is an incidental medium it came at a certain point of time it would vanish it is practically already vanished by now uh, now more and more uh, we we read things online we read things on screen we even are having this discussion this entire academic activity on screen so in terms of your curricular content maybe some texts could be which are still print texts but we are moving on but furthermore it's not that only when all print has been superseded that popular culture studies will truly take place i mean print will also continue orality will also continue it's a multimedial setup but yes so uh, it's not a question of we changing the dynamics the dynamics are changing new media have taken over new media and even this shall pass maybe uh, maybe a few uh, several decades down the line we would think that ha us zamane mein internet pe hum kaam karte the maybe that would have been an option Absolute medium, just like uh, 
pagers have become obsolete now so technology moves very fast right um, uh, so don't get too worked up about the print bit uh, because and neither must we be so worried about print so what if there is print what is the problem let there be print also print is also a technology print is not something that just kind of uh, happens like out of thin air yes thank you sir so uh, there is uh, another question by mukesh kumar and he is asking apart from technical innovation what are the other causes which led to the democratization mm -hmm. of study in india yes no technical innovation i stated as my second point technical innovation made necessary that non print texts also entered the classroom but the democratizing aspect i did not necessarily connect to technical innovation i connected to freedom movements liberation movements so right from the end of the 19th century all over the world movements of working classes movements of people of color movements of women movements of people of caste in our own subcontinent it led to social movements all over so from the beginning of 20th century the whole of the 20th century and is still continuing are marked by waves of social movements and every social movement is led to inclusion inclusion of people that were earlier left out of the hallowed portals of the university so earlier only upper class in indian context upper caste clearly so upper class upper caste male probably heterosexual also because you had to follow certain normative parameters could only and so coming from a rich background only they could enter universities but social movements a whole history a series of social movements starting with marxism feminism the black rights movements in india anti caste movements the lgbt movement there are so many series of movements that have led to this more inclusive democratizing space and the point that i mentioned was that earlier universities could could afford to not even deal with oh the un logo ka culture hai wo to aise hi garib logon ka auraton ka bachchon ka daliton ka isse hame kya lena dena but the democratized more inclusive university space where now we enter and we enter with our cultural baggage so that necessitates that our curriculum also becomes responsive to that so that was a second explanation that is not connected to technology that is connected to social movements and inclusion and therefore a democratized demography in university structures which has also led to popular culture becoming welcomed within curricular structures where earlier only high culture had a place yes thank you so much sir thank you once again for answering all the questions such a patient manner uh now i would like to call uh, i think there is just one question at the end since we have answered so many why not this one also so right. how is popular culture similar and dissimilar with raymond williams's analysis of well it's not a question of being similar or dissimilar it's part of the same project so when raymond williams analyzes culture he analyzes popular culture popular culture is also part of culture so i don't think there is there is any distinction per se Uh, right yes now i have indeed answered all questions yes uh, sorry prachi uh, yeah back to you uh, thank you sir uh the uh, i mean uh, uh the manjeet my friend joined actually sir very late uh, he was in his school he came running but uh, because of lot of uh, our friends who had already joined uh, your lecture so we could not incorporate him so the question that he was asking you have already spoken in the beginning when you were talking about raymond williams the idea of culture so therefore i thought that uh, uh let's not be too repetitive right and obviously i could see that uh, uh, it's a 1 hour 20 minutes uh, uh, that you have been speaking so uh, i was thinking that uh, let's not <laughs> torture you <laughs> more <laughs> regarding that no i'm not tortured at all in jmu <laughs> the classes are minimally 2 hour long and we often have four hour long okay. classes so i'm used to speaking for hours at stretch in fact i thought 45 minutes was too less i'm not used to speaking for 45 minutes i speak for a couple of hours but anyway thank you very much for your concern and uh, i understand uh, i understand the the question and yes so th thank you thank you very much uh, and so uh, actually uh, uh, generally we uh, keep the talk for two hours but because the popular culture when like uh, you yourself have uh, given a lot of the list of the authors and uh, the critical theoreticians so uh, i thought let them be get introduced to these ideas first let's say i'm sure that they have read raymond williams keywords and they are reading uh, uh, walter benjamins and uh, 
and later on if possible uh, they will be reading also the book by Raymond Williams called television and uh, then uh, Theodore Rader no obviously uh, uh, he is the one who is very very difficult uh, person uh, so uh, so i thought that in fact uh, you told about Stuart Hall and you told about how Horkheimer and others so they will read uh, and then obviously they will be more informed uh, critical mass when they will listen to uh, popular culture so therefore i thought that let's keep it for just one hour so that they can understand certain ideas and they can uh, proceed ahead with those uh, uh, further ideas and later on they can uh, again uh, and i'm obviously uh, thankful to you that uh, i mean uh, i mean because uh, the university is uh, uh, the faculty people are occupied in evaluating the answer seats and admission processes going on, but you accepted our invitation. So I was very excited because I was the first time listening to you, but I have already listened as I spoke, like I uh, uh, wrote a message to you that I had listened a lot about you. So I thought that uh, I'll ask uh, you to come and also interact with my students uh, because there are a lot of students who have been uh, grappling with the ideas of popular culture and are also thinking of continuing their research uh, in that uh, uh, field. So I'm uh, very, very uh, uh, thankful to you. I mean, <laughs> let's be a bit formal now. And uh, thanks to uh, everyone who uh, joined today and uh, participated in this uh, uh, lecture, uh, lecture of uh, Professor Sagada Bhaduri. So uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, See you next yeah. time. Thank you. And thank you so you. much. Thank you so much. And and I'll, yes. I'll leave the people. Yes. Just one last. And then once they read, I'll ask you, please uh, come again and interact with them. Uh, that, that will be beneficial for the.